anyway, but I'll say it again. I want to thank the owners because it's not cheap and it's not easy, but um, they said yes to do this, which is uh, a terrific thing. Thank you, Penny, just over there. Um, but, um, e yeah, if you got a lot of money, you do it. It's not too much. <laughs> and um, I, I, I have seen it, and it's really, really great. And it, um, it's funny because the film is now, I think we're further away from when the film takes place than we were, you know, when we made it. So it starts to kind of feel like a movie, more and more like a movie from that time, you know, there's no distance. But um, it was relatively easy, you know, Robert uh, also who shot the film did such a wonderful job, the negative was so strong, um, that we were able to, with the help of Photochem, make um, a blow-up photochem yeah, for any nerds who you know know normally you might, you might do it a 70 millimeter blow up digitally these days. It's kind of a bit easier, um, but this really was we were able to do it and it, and it looks great and, 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 and it sounds great too. So yeah. Have you seen this movie? That's Too many spoilers for them, but you were in a hot tub with Burt Reynolds. <laughs> I was, and I'm saying I told you. <laughs> so what was your just what was your favorite day uh, on this on this film? What is the day that when you think about this film now, you're like, oh, that's the day, or like, that was a, a favorite moment. Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's hard to say a favorite. You know, this whole thing was like an amazing process. You know, it's funny, the Paul is now this amazing legend of a director who's done so much and is held in such high esteem. At this time, he was hustling to get a gig. <laughs> and so all the months and everything leading up to making this movie were this really special time in my life, I think in our lives. And um, so the favorite moments that jump out really, it's like a stream. I remember getting to the end of the shoot and thinking, that was the most fun summer I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the ensemble of actors and everyone, just getting to feel like part of this family was really a, a special thing. Um, we were just talking about at dinner before we came here, that <laughs> Paul cruelly made me do a magic trick in front of Ricky Jay. <laughs> you don't know Ricky Jay is <laughs> passed away, but he was one of the great magicians of the world. <laughs> so as a child magician, I was really humiliated by that. How was it as a young director? I mean, you, you directed Philip Baker Hall before, but you had like Ridgely, I, mean, I guess you had done before, but you had some titans or Ricky Jay's older uh, gentleman. But was it, were you uh, timid at first or were you just sh sh uh, straight out? Um. No, you know, I, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't timid, um, I, was, I was confident, I was probably overly confident, but I think the confidence came from, you know, it's, it's easy to have confidence when you have great actors, because you don't, you don't really know any better, they're, they're so versatile, and able to give you what you need, um, you know, you become timid when, you know, you don't know how to help an actor, right? at least at that time, I, I you know, my first movie was with, Sam Jackson, Quentin Palfrey, Phil Baker, and John Riley. You know, I mean, I was spoiled rotten, so I didn't know what it was like to the challenge of working with somebody who might get cranky or might not know their lines or something like that. Um, so, and, you know, um, I was intimidated a little bit by Burt Reynolds at first. Um, I think we all were, but we were also excited to work with him, um, the, the possibilities of working with him. Um, and we had a lot of terrific um, people from the porn industry who were, you know, uh, so I, they were not shy about removing their clothes, you know, that was really helpful, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't want, you know, the young film director, you know, it was, that was kind of, you know, we had to test in situations that could have been uncomfortable um, to ask people to remove their clothes and stuff like that. And, and, and yeah, the, the, they were up for it. And I, that was the comfort of working with actors who are there for you. It doesn't make you timid, it, makes you, it really it, it feeds you. I mean, and if anything, you feel like, well, they're dancing, they're, they're you know, all 
this energy and they're giving it to you, 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 you feel more pressure to do right by them. And everyone did such, it was such a great ensemble cast. I imagine as each stage you went through, you got more and more comfort. Everyone felt like this is really something happening. Especially the opening shot of this film, yeah. or the opening. Once you must have accomplished that with all the choreography, can you, can you talk about a little shooting that? Uh, yeah, I think we ended up shooting that pre pretty deep into making the movie, so we had a little bit of confidence to do it. Maybe not too deep, but um, we had um, you know, a terrific assistant director, John Wilderness, uh to help make that all that happen, and a great cast, a great steady camera operator, and Shuttleworth. Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, it's funny, I think, I, to your question is that we did, we did do like a lot of rehearsals beforehand. And there was a kind of a decent, um, great camaraderie amongst the kind of gang of, of, of guys part, part of the movie, like John and, and Mark and, and Phil and Thomas Jane. And, um, so that, that was really helpful. That by the time we started, we did, and we talked about it enough, certainly John and I had, I've been, you know, kind of desperate to try to do it for years. Um, so that when we started, we, we were not we were not going to lose any time. You know, there was no there was no there wasn't that much time really, you know, to do all that we were trying to do. We were just attacking every single day, and every day there was no break. There was no break. Every day was felt like it was a big scene. Um, yeah, I remember we shot we rehearsed the the dance number that happens in that first sequence in a roller rink across the street from where the club was. <laughs> that was interesting. And I, I want to point something else out about the movie, which is that at the time that the movie was being put together, porn was still this major taboo. It existed, of course, on video and everything, and people were aware of it, but it wasn't so seeped into the culture like it has been since the internet, you know? At the time, people had to be convinced, their agents had to be convinced, Hey, you know, don't worry. You can associate your client with this movie that's about porn. You know, like it was actually kind of people viewed it as a big risk. And I remember we were nominated for like best ensemble or something at the SAG Awards. I remember just sitting at this table off to the side, and I really felt like a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone thinks we're really porn star. You know, sh shove this over to the side here at this table. And, you know, eat your filthy chicken. You know. <laughs> it was real humanizing. Uh, it wasn't just porn, it was uh, Julian Moore's gift of everyone. Well, you, you know, to what John said, you have to understand that I was like 25 years old and had a script that was like, 180 pages, and you know, that had like, it was like all, like all this porn, all this drugs and everything else, and I did that, I made my first film, so there was a lot of confusion about exactly what this might be, and two, two great things happened. First is Mike DeLuca, who ran New Line Cinema at the time, and made incredible films um, um, at that time read it and trusted me and we really hit it off so there was a backing of that so that's that's a great that's a great place to start but more to the point was that when Julianne Moore said, said yes that was a really big deal because other actors have always and especially when she was starting out and so they're like if she's doing it it's got to have something it really it was like a, a seal of approval and legitimacy from her meant a lot to other actors. She worked with Don Cheadle, so suddenly Don paid a little bit more attention to it. Um, I think she also had already done a scene with Altman with her pants off. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is nothing to It feels more about the struggle. How did this? When I watch it, I always go, "How did this get made?" It's like, okay, well, it got made because I convinced Mike that Leonardo DiCaprio and Jack Nicholson were going to be in. He's like, it's fucking great. You can do it. I can do it for fourteen million dollars. I'm like, no problem. And then, um, you know, if you follow this kind of stuff, quite famously, Leonardo decided to do Titanic instead of. Which he regrets now, but <laughs> I think he did all right. And um, I don't think I could have. I don't think I got Jack 
Nicholson to read the script eventually. I don't think he did uh, get to it. I don't think he got to it. That was hard. But that's okay, because that would have been something else. And Bert was always somebody that was really, really right for it. And, and you know, it happens in casting that you, you really do end up with the people who are supposed to be there. And, and, and Leo did suggest Mark. They had just done the basketball diaries. You have to understand that Mark, you know, he was known as this rapper and underwear model, and he was very concerned. Like, do you just want me to be in this because I'll, I'll be in my underwear? And I, and I met with him, and he was just electric. He was so fantastic. And actually, I saw Jamie Foley movie Fear. Him, and he was great. Yeah. And so we didn't want the underwear at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it is, it is he and Martin's body. I'm like, this is good. This is good. <laughs> oh, he still fucking looks like. <laughs> you know, he's got his own workout line now. He's like, that's Instagram. He's kind of crazy. <laughs> Yes, of course. So the Alfred Molina scene we shot about, uh, I think it was about five days, well, maybe four or five days, which is a really long time. Um, to be firecrackers going off and smoke and everything else. PTSD of those fucking firecrackers. The one thing I can remember about that scene was, was feeling like after we rehearsed it and knocked it out, feeling like. Something nagged me that something was not quite right, and that, that is, there's a problem that I can't put my finger on, and I don't know what it is, and I guess we should just start shooting. And I'm really afraid because it's the, it's the end of the movie. And then when we ro rolled and the first firecracker went off for real, I was very relieved. I said, well, that was what was missing, is that we didn't do a rehearsal with firecrackers. So when he started throwing his firecrackers, my friend Joe Chan, and you see everybody jump, I thought, well, actually, this, this is going to be pretty good. <laughs> I guess I don't want to ruin something too much for you, but anybody who's seen the movie, maybe this is good for you to know, is that if you can remember, or maybe when you see it coming up in the movie, in that scene, when he, there's a very, very long take on Mark's face, and he just absolutely blanks out. That is not something that was planned or scripted. That was like the last shot after five days of doing this scene. He, like, his mind just stopped. <laughs> completely off. He didn't know where he was. was like, and if you're watching as a director, you're like, this is fucking magic. <laughs> insane volume of M16 fire into the house because he had a rifle and so the house just gets sprayed with bullets and the, we cut out of it sooner than that or Paul cut out of it sooner than that in the edit but that room was was completely wired with 2,000 squibs or something like that. so it was this sense on the set like we're literally in a tinderbox box like, the whole fucking thing could explode in a second. It gave it this edge, like, just being on that set. <laughs> Your friendship with Dirk, when they, when they first meet, is one of the best scenes. It's like, uh, you know, we really fall in love with both these guys. Uh, was that all on the page, or uh, did you rehearse to, to find that relationship? We didn't rehearse that scene, and I think a lot of it is on the... Page, um, but when you have John, you know you have to let him provide because it's always better when he, when, when he does. Um, but he also knew that it was one shot that he could do it and then do one little thing. So you know the Han Solo thing, he could provide. <laughs> I think he did, or maybe I suggested, and he did come with a little bit. I don't remember. But but um, but that one, that's one instance where I think it, I think it's pretty close to the script. I don't remember. You know. But I think it was one of the first scenes that I shot with Mark. So it was, you were, right. I was to put us in that first. 
position like that. Yeah. Okay. Graham does such a great job, and she has to do it on roller skates. So. <laughs> she, had, she, she did not really know how to roller skate. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what her learning curve was. I've seen her maybe a couple months before, kind of not knowing how to roller skate, to, she did, I mean, you know, she went full Daniel Day-Lewis on it. <laughs> 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 so, and then he over rocky terrain and everything, and she just became incredible at it. And um, Heather's such an underrated actress, I think. I mean, she's sort of an icon, but she's really so incredible. Um, I, I look at particularly those scenes that she has with Julianne and then, you know, having a good time. <laughs> And, and Phil, once again, with a brilliant performance and such an unflattering portrayal of someone's self. And it's amazing to look at, like when you look at the master or the mattress king, and they're so confident, and his ability to play completely unconfident. Uh, yeah. uh, can you talk just a little bit about, about Phil and this? And I just thought, you know, he makes uh, Dirk Diggler sexier because of his love of it. You know, I think, it's, it, and I, I think it was probably something for Phil to set aside all vanity, you know, and Phil had that, um, that ability to do that, you know. Some actors might not go all the way, or they might get that costume fitting and go, you know, this is really hard for me. And even if it was hard for Phil, it doesn't show it, and he's just going to play that guy, and that's what he did. And it's, you know, that, that what him and Mark Bridges, the costume designer, came up with, to push forward what, what's going on with, with Scotty, Scotty J. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've never worked with someone who gave less of a shit about vanity. <laughs> I did I play with him on Broadway, and we would have to do these events, and I always would overcompensate with the way I dressed, you know, like, all right, I'm going to Sardis, I guess I'm supposed to be fancy and wear a suit. And Phil literally has the same dirty chinos and hoodie that he had on the day before. Like, this is who I am. If you don't like it, too fucking bad. Like, I'm not going to get dressed up for Sardis. Like, I my bike here. <laughs> you know, something really great about it, tough fierceness about him. He had his eye on the important things. But he, it also, you know, he also would never take his coat off. If he rode his bike all the way there, and it was like, you know, 40 degrees out and it was cold, he'd sit in a restaurant in his coat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not going to stay very long either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bert wasn't, like, he wasn't at the top of his fame at this point, right? And uh, he did deliverance, he's great in that, but he never... <clears throat> And this was, to me, still the greatest performance he's ever done. And when you watch it, you're like, oh, you're a great movie star, but this was in you the whole time. Like, it's so good. You're like, you could have, instead of being just a movie star, you, I feel like you could have you done that. Yeah, he's so, he's so terrific in the movie, you know. And it wasn't the easiest at times, because he, he could be challenging, but, and I was young, and... But I did see it the when we did the print, and I looked back and I watched his performance with some distance I hadn't seen in a long time. And that was one of the, the biggest things that I took away, was just how remarkable he is in the movie. Um, I think he, um, you know, he was the oldest person on the set, and, and also had, he, he was the one who would, you could look at you or look at you, and just like, you were in diapers at this time. I was here and the biggest movie star in the world, so I know how to get into a fucking jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that kind of stuff, you're like, you know, little details of like, look at him, how he gets in the jacuzzi, and how he goes, like, turn those bubbles on for me, do all this stuff, it's just like, it's just like, it's like syrup coming out of him. And then, or when he does that scene with Roller Girl and Kyle Lennox, our friend who's here, he's in the back of the limo, you know, and he's on the mic with the tuxedo on. He's just like, he's, um, he just owns that kind of stuff. And, 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 he, and he has a tenderness, too, you know. Um, Bert did in, in some of his best performances. It's kind of like tough kind of stuff, but he's, he was very, very tender um, underneath all that kind of machismo stuff. He's also a contemporary of, like, Marlon Brando. You know, like, that's where Bert saw himself in the, in the, in the world of film. Was with, those were his peers, you know? And then he went on to be this very charming kind of raconteur, uh, you know, the sexiest man alive for maybe the longest run anybody's ever had in America. <laughs> right? I mean, Tom Selleck maybe a little bit longer. But, you know, so it's funny that you, you, 
you name check deliverance and then Boogie Nights, but Bert, Bert is very underrated, you know? His charm and his ability with comedy, um, he, was, he, was, he was really an amazing actor that, that took the opportunities he was given, but I think of him in that context all the time, you know, he got, he told us one time Marlon Brando like insulted him at a restaurant, he's like, I knew where he lived. <laughs> so I left that restaurant, I went straight to his house. And I waited in the front yard for him to come home. <laughs> so kick his ass. <laughs> and I was like, what happened, Bertie? He's like, he didn't come home, so I stuck. <laughs> it's like a homeless story, but it makes me feel like, oh, he was like, gonna go toe to toe with Barnum and Graham. <laughs> okay, that's who we're dealing with. <laughs> Bert would have won that too. Yeah. He <laughs> was a strong, he was a strong, strong. Which is William H. Macy uh, yeah. in this. And uh, also, there's, I mean, just watch it. <laughs> I think people brought this up before. There's a line he says that doesn't make any sense when his wife's there. Right. <laughs> he, did, he didn't do that on purpose. He did it by accident. He said, I'm sorry, I'll correct that. And then he did it again. He said, I don't know what's wrong with this. And it's funny coming from him. He's one of those actors. Like, he gets every every single thing that you write, even if there's a typo. Yeah, like, like Mammoth guy. Yeah, man, yeah. man guy. So everything is exactly as you want. But he had some kind of, I don't know if he would be Freudian or not. <laughs> seeing it through Ricky's point of view uh, and like kind of it's really not his job as an actor he's an actor he's, he's busy being the best magician in the world so he kind of turns up to these days where he's got to direct you know summer and sky lesbians and porno and do all this kind of stuff and it's, it's kind of it's, it's amazing to, to go through that um, one of his great memories was the first rehearsal meeting um, I think they quote something like this I think it's a terrific cast I met Julianne Moore, who's lovely, and I met John Riley, who's lovely. I met Mark Wahlberg, who seems great. And he had a very large, uh, he had a very large plate of potato salad. Only Ricky would notice that. Probably the last time Mark had carbs. <laughs> Let's watch some magic. All right, ladies and gentlemen.